Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today's webinar is Use ArcGIS Pro to Evaluate Climate Change Data. Climate change is in the news more than ever, and the projected changes are characterized as dire. How will climate change impact the area where you live? This webinar is an installation of the 2019 ESRI Spatial Data Webinar Series. The webinar will be recorded and shared with you. I am your host, Carissa Schrader, and I'm here to connect you with the authoritative content available through ESRI's data and location services offerings. I'm joined here today with guests Charlie Fry and Dan Fasut. Charlie is our chief cartographer here at ESRI, and Dan is our environmental content lead. We're happy to have them on board to share with us about climate data and walk us through how we can get started in using this data for projecting environmental change. We're gonna kick things off today with a few poll questions just to help us get a little more familiar with your experience in using climate data and ArcGIS Pro. I'll share a brief overview of the Living Atlas data and additional resources that you might find helpful. Charlie will then introduce the concepts that we'll, we will discuss in today's webinar. And then we will hand things over to Dan who will share best practices for adding climate data to ArcGIS Pro. Charlie will share with us how to transform climate data into place-based knowledge. And then we will take a look at how to use ArcGIS Pro to make the information in the fourth national climate assessment come to life through analysis. We'll reserve time to answer questions at the end of the webinar. Please feel free to utilize the chat option to ask your questions and we will address topics as time permits. Resources are also available in the webinar window please use the PDF provided to access links to the material discussed today. Now, for our first poll question, what is your experience in using ArcGIS Pro? Go ahead and click your response. I'll share the results with the group. Great. It actually looks like we have new users and moderate users on the call, and some of you have actually never used Pro before. So we're glad to have you on board, and we're excited to share more with you about the, the software. Now on to our next question. Why do you want to learn about using ArcGIS Pro to work with climate data? Again, go ahead and click your response. I'll share the results with the group. Interesting. It looks like a lot of you want to create climate related products and you want help in supporting your research. We're really glad that you're here today and we look forward to helping you grow. So thank you so much for participating with us. Now, before we get started, let's just make sure that we have all the resources that we need to be successful. We'll be featuring a few data sets today within the Global Historic Climate Network Daily or GHCND data set. This is available in ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World and can be used for world historical climate and US historical climate data. For those of you unfamiliar with the Living Atlas, this is your place to find locational data that you can trust. It features ready to use data, maps and apps, and the Living Atlas is your authoritative source for quality curated content to kickstart your analysis. Our learn lesson, Explore Future Climate Projections, is available as part of our resource document on the live webinar. This is a great resource for you to follow along to evaluate the climate data on your own. You don't have to be a climate scientist to get started in using this data, and this learn lesson is a great resource to you so that you can do your own analysis on your own time. 
You can always find our extensive listings of Learn Lessons at learn.arcgis.com. Now, let's get started in talking about climate. Charlie, would you like to kick things off? Thanks, Carissa. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about why we're doing this webinar. And for me, one of the biggest reasons was over the last year learning that a lot of people had no idea ArcGIS Pro could be used to explore and analyze climate data. And second, and this kind of gets back to the big promise of GIS, which is that GIS affords us the opportunity to understand our world better and because of that make better informed decisions. Consider that the vast majority of us, including scientists and policymakers, have never seen the data on climate change for ourselves or themselves and have never had the chance to form and ask their own questions based on seeing that data. And yet they may already have taken a position. So one of our intentions today is to get that data seen by a much broader audience. So what I'm going to kick off here is, uh, is an ArcGIS Pro session where I've got a few layers that have been uh, set up. Uh, they're coming from that uh, learn.arcgis.com lesson. And in particular, the, the, the layer that I'm showing right now is for mean annual temperature anomaly. An anomaly is how climate, sci climate scientists say change. So what this is saying is that uh, be uh, between 2040 and 2059, we think the Earth is going to warm up by this much. Um, this layer is part of a uh, collection of 852 climate variables that are available in that learning lesson. And uh, you can find information about those on the resource page. Uh, ESRI worked with the staff uh, of the uh, Research Application Laboratory from the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research and the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Most of you know that as UCAR and NCAR. And they produce the data for this lesson. Uh, these data are part of what's called a multi-model ensemble that represents the means and standard deviations for temperature and precipitation anomalies from 10 different climate models. <clears throat> we asked the scientists at UCAR and NCAR to select the 10 best models out of, at the time, or nearly 40, or representing climate change generally for a broad audience. And thus, I'm going to click on a values to give you an idea of what happens. So I, I see that uh, here in Southern Africa that uh, we're expecting uh, 1.9 degrees of Celsius, or a little over 3 degrees Fahrenheit uh, uh, warming to occur by uh, uh, 2040 to 2059. So next, I want to give you a uh, relative sense for the impact for future climates. And, and we asked UCAR and CAR to uh, um, also provide data that represented the uh, historical basis for this multi-model ensemble. And so I'm going to show you a couple of layers that, that begin to do that. The first is uh, what the uh, mean annual temperatures are. And so this just gives you a quick idea. I'm going to turn off one of these layers here. and. One of the important things about this data set is that it's global. So it's uh, the oceans, being almost 70% of our Earth's surface, drive a lot of climate processes. So it's important that we have climate data over the oceans. Uh, we also have uh, precipitation data. So here's the historical precipitation data. And you can see that uh, rain is concentrated uh, in the, the equatorial regions in this map. And then finally, we can get an idea of where precipitation change is going to occur. You can see again, the equatorial regions are probably going to receive quite a bit more rain, but it looks like it's going to shift around a little bit. Also, something that's important if you're going to evaluate or work with climate data, it's, to, it's good to understand what these values actually mean. So when I say mean annual, what I'm really saying is that uh, we have taken the daily means for every day for 20 years and said, this is the mean of those values. Uh, it's, and it can be a little hard to get your head around because uh, the daily mean may not actually last very long as a temperature on any given day. Uh, we have mins and we have maxes and you know it's, it's probably going to be hit twice a day as we get warmer and as we cool off. Uh, the same thing happens, although for rainfall it's a little bit different because what we're doing is we're taking the, uh, in this case, the uh, mean of the sum of all rainfall that's accumulated for each year. So. Um, one, let's see, I want to get a little, get back on track here for, from my script. So one of the things we also did here is uh, uh, took a look at uh, what you need to understand to get a little bit better insight than just global means or, or a, a, a mean annual figure. And when I took uh, physical geography way back in uh, Kansas State University, one of the things I learned 
was that uh, seeing monthly means was a lot more informative because then you got to see seasonal change. And so the graphs on the right here, uh, I made these for where I live today, which is Redlands, California. And I can see what the mean monthly temperatures are. You can, and you can see we get fairly warm summers. And then I also see the uh, uh, change. And, I, and I've actually made the change. You know, I can move this diagram or this graph a little bit so I can make it match what uh, the scale is for the uh, temperature down here. So I get a sense for how much warmer it's going to be in each month where I live. So our goal for the rest of the time is to show you some of how we made these kinds of layers and, and, and the data sources for them, as well as uh, um, how to begin to use them in analysis. So I'm going to turn things over to Dan, who's going to begin to show you that. One moment while we switch the screen. All right, thank you, Charlie. So as you've seen, ArcGIS Pro can handle working with commonly available gridded uh, format climate data. Now I'm gonna take you through some examples of the simple workflows that you might use while analyzing climate model data in ArcGIS Pro. To start, if you haven't used ArcGIS Pro before, you'll notice four key areas of the layout on my screen. At the top are my tools. Um, and they're just like the ribbon panel on Microsoft Office that you're probably familiar with. This is where you're going to find all the things that you're going to use to work with your data. On the left is uh, the contents in my uh, current map. And you can see that there's nothing uh, there besides my base maps that are turned on, and that's where the checkboxes are. In the center is my current map area um, with the tabs for all of the different maps that I have in my project. And on the right is uh, both my contents catalog and then also where I have um, the menus for all the tools that I'll be using as I go through this exercise. So before I begin, I should note that all the data that we'll be working with uh, is listed in the resources page um, in the learn lesson associated with this webinar. So to start, I'm going to add some NetCDF data to my map. You can do that in a few different ways and I'll be going through each of them. The easiest is uh, just to go to the Add Data uh, tab here in your ribbon panel and select Multi-Dimensional Raster Layer. Um, I'm going to add uh, the baseline precipitation data that Charlie mentioned. So all I have to do is select the data file and then select the variable that I want to show. And it's going to load into the map. Next, I'm going to do the same thing for uh, my temperature data but I'm going to do it in a different way. This way I'm going to use, this time I'm going to use a geoprocessing tool called, um, in, in, instead of the, the Add Data tab. Uh, why, you might ask? Uh, because um, even though it's going to be a little bit more complicated, um, it does provide some more flexibility, and I promise to show you all these different options. So uh, two different ways that we can do this now. If my time series data were all in separate files, so one month in one file, another month in another file, um, you would want to do that by creating uh, a mosaic. And if I spell it correctly, uh, you'll see it right here. Create mosaic data set, and then you would just add the rasters to that. But since all of my data are in one file, I can do that just by uh, creating a, a, a NetCDF raster layer. So I'm going to type in here, make NetCDF. And you'll see uh, there's a couple different options that I have. Um, we have a raster layer, uh, features, which would be associated with point data. Um, but again, I'm going to use uh, the make NetCDF raster. And just like before in the add data, all I have to do is point to my data select the variable, and then run the tool. And there we go, we have temperature that's showing up on the screen. Um, so now if you click on the map, and you saw the identify tool before that Charlie showed, you'll see that this particular area of the ocean has a mean um, annual temperature of 16.4 degrees C. Um, but maybe you want to uh, communicate uh, these values in imperial uh, rather than metric units. 
So we're going to do a really quick conversion using some of our raster functions. So if I go up here to my raster functions tab, I can do uh, conversion. You'll see that there's a unit conversions. And then all I have to do is select the layer that I want to convert, convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. And it's automatically created that new layer. Um, and so you can see that same area is about 65 degrees. All right, I'm, I'm going to uh, get rid of that because we like to work in C since this is global data. All right, so I'm going to uh, turn off the, um, the temperature layer and uh, look at my preset. Uh, so now you're looking at this, this, uh, this data and it's uh, got these, this default color scale to it, which is not one of my favorites, uh, anything with a rainbow. Um, so we might want to modify that. So we're going to click on the layer click on symbology, and then you'll see here we have our stretch function. We also have classify and other ways in which you can symbolize the data, but you can pull from a variety of different um, color palettes here. Um, but if we want to make sure that we have a consistent symbology when we, um, when we add in other files that might have other ranges of data or other statistics, We'll want to be able to do that in a consistent way so that we can compare maps to maps. So the best way to do that is by going in and creating a raster of known um, data values. And so we do that with what's called um, make random raster. So if you create a random raster, you're basically just going to give it a name. And then over here, you can specify with the ideal min and max values of your raster are. So you could say, I want my color palette or this raster to go from negative 20 to 20 C or whatever range of data that you would want. Um, and so what I have is that pre-calculated so I don't have to run it. So basically what I did is create this random raster that has uh, these uh, precipitation values from zero to 7,000 millimeters. And then I applied a color palette to it. Um, and now once I've chosen the, the color uh, range that I want and I set it to min max, I can save off this particular style of how I want my precipitation map to look and all other precipitation maps in the future. So we call that as when you right click on the layer, you select sharing and save as layer file. All right, so um, basically what I can do is now go over, turn that off, go over import on my preset layer, that precipitation style fire, and then um, style fire, style mm -hmm. file. Mm -hmm. And then um, also do that for one that I've already pre-cooked for temperature. So there we go, we can see global temperature. Now if I turn that off, we have the precipitation data. So now that we've looked at the baseline data, let's examine the future scenarios that Charlie's talked about. I'm going to add uh, um, some, some more data to my project. And for this particular uh, project, I'm gonna choose the RCP 2.6 and 8.5 climate scenarios for the monthly mean temperature anomalies averaged across 2040 to 2059. And that sounds kind of complicated, but I'm going to walk you through that in a little bit more uh, uh, chewable bites. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <laughs> so really quickly, if you're not familiar with RCPs, these are the different pathways or scenarios that have been used for climate modeling by the last uh, global assessment. RC RCP 2.6 is associated with the lowest greenhouse gas emissions, and it results in 2.6 watts per meter square of warming for that area by 2100, that's where you get that 2.6. RCP 8.5 is associated with a higher level of greenhouse gas emissions and has a higher level of warming 8.5 um, watts per meter square. Um, hopefully that, that makes a little bit more sense again now. So basically now what I'm gonna go in and do is um, add some of that data to my map. So again, I'm gonna go into the multi-dimensional um, raster layer 
select the files. You can see I have temperature RCP 2.6. And then I'm going to do the same thing again for 8.5. And um, also, again, I'm going to just add in a, um, a, a layer file on here. Uh, so these things uh, look somewhat normal and not all um, crazy colors. And now, if we zoom out, we can see, especially in the higher latitudes, the difference between the two layers. I'm actually going to label these things. RCP 2.6, change the, the file name so we don't confuse things as we go a little further. So here we go. We have the two layers, and we can see the differences in warming between the two. So in, in compare to them, you can, you, you can compare these, these different data layers in a couple ways. Um, first, you'll see that, um, that ArcGIS Pro knows that there's time associated with these NetCDF files, and that we can scroll through time using the, the, the time slider here. Um, another interesting way in which we can compare these is um, if we go into our, um, our Appearance tab, we can actually swipe between the two layers, the one on top and the one on bottom. And so we can get a really quick comparison between the two files. If I select, um, um, I can also, of course, click on one of the layers and click on another one, and we can start to compare the actual values in, in those cases. Um, and that's using that identify function. You can also graph the data. So you can create a chart, um, and Charlie's going to talk a little bit more about this later, so I'm not going to go into it, um, a histogram or a scatter plot or a line graph of the different data over time in your two different uh, series, and you can compare the two in a, similar, in a single graph. And you can also run um, some more in-depth analysis of this data, and that's what I'm going to do now. So. Here I want to know what the maximum monthly mean temperature is for each scenario. And then I want to compare those two scenarios. So to do that, I'll use um, what we call the raster editor, which is a lot like using Model Builder, if you're familiar with that in, um, in other ArcGIS software or in, in using um, vector data. So if we go over to analysis um, and we have our raster functions here, We've seen all those other types of raster functions that we used before for converting, but there's a lot of other neat utilities for doing statistical analysis on the cells and, and cleaning up your data and changing the way it's displayed. Um, and this is what we're going to be using here. So first I'm going to go into, I'm going to open up the raster editor. Then I'm just going to drop in my two RCP functions. Um, from the um, statistics tab, I'm going to um, drop in a cell statistics for each one. So I want to calculate um, the maximum for each of those, um, those monthly time series. So all I have to do is connect the one to the other. So I'm saying um, I'm going to run cell statistics on RCP on that one and cell statistics on RCP 2.6 on that one. And then I just go into the, uh, the dialog and I choose what kind of cell statistics I want to run. And I want to do a maximum. You could do a mean or all these other um, permutations. The cell size, I want it to be the mean of the cell size. And that's useful if you have different types of data. Here, it doesn't really matter, but um, since it's all uniform, but that's um, it defaults to um, max, and typically you do want a mean. All right, so now, after I eventually run this, it's going to compute the max for each of those time series. Um, but I want to do a difference between the two. So basically what I can do is now say I want the difference between, between um, RCP 8.5 and 2.6. 
And again, I'm just going to do the mean of the cell size and the intersection, and that's great. So I'm going to save this off. And you can call it whatever you want. And this is so you can use it later on if you want to run a similar analysis on other data sets or other time series. Great, so there we, we see it right there. So I'm just going to um, open the raster function editor and run it. There we go, we get the result. And I actually have it right here. And I've already applied a styling to it. Um, so we can see the difference between the two models uh, quantitatively that right here it's 3.9, uh, minus four degrees C in um, the 8.5 scenario warmer than the 2.6 scenario. Um, and you can go around and you could also run some other statistical analyses that could, um, that could summarize uh, this, this one raster for you, or again, do different types of graphing. Um, so one last step um, might be to share this map. Um, so that's really easy in ArcGIS Pro. It's meant to have a natural connection between your desktop workflow and your, um, your web GIS. So I'll, if I wanted to uh, create this and share this as a web map for other people to use, it's as easy as um, putting in a, a, a name, summary, some tags for it, um, analyzing the data. And you would want to put more uh, detail in there. You can run the um, analysis to make sure everything's configured correctly, and then you would hit share, and it would publish to your ArcGIS Online account. So then you could share that, um, that web map with other people. Um, and then you could also, even if you wanted to, uh, build that into one of our uh, templated apps. So what I've done here is share those two different layers of RCP, RCP 8.5 and 2.6 into a swipe app. And this is basically um, a templated app on ArcGIS Online. And you would just point to your two different web maps and it's ready to go. I can do it, so you can do it. And I have no technical expertise in web development whatsoever. All right, so we've just explored analyzing climate model data, um, but we also know that there's many other components to climate data analysis, ranging from inferred climates using uh, tree rings and ice cores, um, which could certainly leverage the um, ArcGIS Pro space-time cube capabilities, um, analyzing climate data records from stations, and of course, analyzing the impacts of uh, seasonal variations to long-term climate variations on things like agriculture. So next, Charlie is gonna uh, take us um, deeper into one of those topics, and that's analyzing historic um, station data. For this, he's gonna be using, um, uh, NOAA's Global Historical Climatology Network, called GHCN. GHCN is, a, is based on um, long-term station data from over 7,500 locations, which you can see here on this particular map. Um, and it's synthesized, um, by the National Centers for Environmental Information on a daily and monthly basis. Uh, from this data, we can see more fine scale trends. Oops, sorry, apparently I, now you can see these 7,500 uh, stations. Sorry about that. Um, so from this data, we can see more fine scale uh, trends and changes than what's possible with the, with the global uh, gridded models. Um, and you can incorporate that into um, um, some finer scale analysis. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Charlie. Okay, thanks, Dan. So what you should see in a moment here on my screen is a uh, map zoomed into Slovakia. And um, what I want to show next is how I made those graphs of monthly temperatures and monthly temperature change that I showed earlier for red ones. So the most important thing that I need is a location where I know the baseline or historical climate. And based on this, I'll be able to show, relatively speaking, how the projected changes in temperature will affect this location. So I was interested in Slovakia because one of my sons got to spend his fall break uh, just to the northeast of Bratislava here in the, near the middle. And I got curious about what the climate might be like. Here. So we're gonna use that uh, GHCND layer that Dan just showed. So I'm gonna turn off the uh, monthly data. But before I do, one thing I just clicked to show, here's what that data looks like when you click on it. And you see this list of values. And it's kind of hard to visualize from the list you know, what, what the differences are and when they are. So now I'm going to go into uh, add some data. And when you want to add data from the Living Atlas, the Add Data dialog already has a node there for you to, to use. And I can click that node. And I'm just going to search for GHCND. 
and I get two layers, and here's the world layer that Dan just showed us. So I'm going to add that. And what I want to find is a station that is nearby this location, and hopefully there's one here. And yes, there is. So I'm going to click on that station to see what uh, kind of information is available from this service. And I get a pretty good summary here. So I, I can see the mean annual temperature. I also get the, uh, the highest daily temperature that occurred within the period from 1981 to 2010, and the lowest as well, and the mean annual precipitation. I also see some graphs. So there, here's the uh, temperature and the precipitation graph. And this is the kind of graph I want to show you how to make in Pro. So in order to do that, what I want to do is isolate just this station so that it's easy to work with. And so the first thing I want to do is to isolate just the fields that I want to use. So I'm going to open up the attribute table. And inside the attribute table, you can right click on any of the field headings and choose fields. And what that does is it gives you a list of the fields that are available in that table. And just to give you an idea of what's available here, let me expand the alias field here. So this is, these are the names that appear in the field headings. So we have mean annual, we mean monthly temperature. We have the, uh, the maximum daily mean for each month and the minimum. We also have the precipitation. And then we have the highest daily temperature that occurred that month as well as the lowest. And then we do the same thing all over again in Fahrenheit and in inches. So I'm going to turn off all of the fields for a moment here by just clicking the, the visible checkbox. And then I'm going to turn back on only the fields that I need uh, to make my analysis work easily. It's a lot easier to work with the dialogues in Pro when you don't have a list of 150 fields in the, to choose from. So I'm going to choose the, the 15 that uh, pertain to this work. And then I save this up here. So this is saving my view of the table, if you will, for this project. Now I, I, can, I can close my table down. And then I'm going to select uh, the station that I'm interested in. So I'm just going to draw a rectangle around that station. And then I'm going to right click on the layer and say data export features. And that opens up a geoprocessing tool called copy features. And all I have to do in this case is enter a, uh, a new uh, new name and location. So I'm going to take my projects database. And then I'm going to pick a name. You can see I've been prototyping this so I know it will work. And then I say save and run. And it doesn't take very long to export one station. so. We'll get that data here, and I'm going to turn off the uh, global data set so everything draws as quickly as possible. And I'll click on this just to show you what uh, we got as a result. Oops, let me use the uh, identify tool. There. So now we have the monthly values for this station here. And this is the same format that I want to use to create the graph uh, that we ultimately make here. And so the thing I need next is the values from each of these rasters to be assigned to this point. So that I want to get 12 more fields, uh, each one telling me the value at that location. And it turns out we have a geoprocessing tool that does exactly that. So I'm going to open up my uh, geoprocessing tool window. And I'm going to type uh, extract. And I'll start, start typing multi, and it'll show me what I want, which is extract multi-values to points. And what this tool does is it takes the point layer, which is the one I just made here. And then what I do is I pick from the raster layers that are available in my uh, project. And I go down and I pick each one of these. And <clears throat> rather than making you watch me pick all 12, I'm just going to pick a few here to show you how I set up the user interface. And I also uh, can uh, edit the field names that I'm going to get in the output. So I would do this for all of these as well. But rather than uh, finish that out, I'm just going to go back and I'm going to add a layer that's got everything already run from this tool. Close this dialog here. Here we go. And back in my project database. So now I have a uh, completed version after running that uh, extract multi values. So what I get here now is I see the original values plus the values that occurred from each of these, uh, for, from each raster data set at that location. So to make a graph out of this, all I have to do is right click on the, uh, the layer that I just added, and I say I want a bar chart. And I'm going to undock this default one and resize it so that we can all see what happens as I make the changes to the chart properties. I'm going to set it so it uses the station name on, on the bottom axis, and we don't need any aggregation in this case. And then, just like I did before with the uh, 
multi extract multi values tool, I'm going to pick my months in order and have them begin appearing up into the, in the graph. And again, I'm going to only do this uh, a few times so you get the idea of what's involved. And then uh, I've got another project that I'll open to show you what this looks like as we get done. So one more thing that I do with with this, and let me get April in here, is that because we're looking at change in temperature or temp average temperature, uh, the best practice is to use the same color because we're not changing variables in this graph. So if I click on the color chip here, I can pick colors that make uh, my graphs look, or my bars all have the same color. All right, so what I'm going to do next is just load a project that's got uh, those graphs already finished. And I'm going to move my uh, window out of the way here. So what you're seeing in these graphs are for this location in Slovakia, what it's, uh, you can see the low temperature in January is normally a little bit below zero. And what we can also see is that the uh, temperature change in this scenario is going to result in warming that'll take that above zero. And that's actually a pretty significant change in this, if you start to think about what the uh, impact is in terms of you know, how much, how much, how many cold hours would you need, say, for agriculture or fruit to grow. The other thing that was surprising to me was how much warmer it's going to get. So it's going to get almost three degrees centigrade warmer, which is well over five degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a uh, pretty significant change. Uh, and as, as, as you probably have seen in the data we've been showing, the further north you go, the, the warmer these scenarios are generally predicting to, uh, projecting us to become. All right, so what I'd like to do next is hand it back to Dan, who's going to tell us a little bit more about some of the GAC and D layer, and particularly the, the US layer that you might have seen when I was uh, adding the data. All right, thanks, Charlie. All right, so. Um, so yeah, as Charlie said, I'm just going to give you a little bit more overview of some, some of the extensions of this data and other things that you can uh, do to work with it. Um, and that will be before uh, Charlie takes us into one last demo. Um, so I showed you this map of the GHCN before, um, and recently we've been partnering with the, um, one of the regional climate centers that's based out of Cornell University. And they've developed this system called ACIS or ACIS. Um, for ingesting and QCing, not just the US GCH, GHC and data, um, but thousands more locations from other climate reference networks in the US. Um, and so when I go to my map here and I turn on that layer, you can really start to see uh, the much greater density of, of station data that we have here. Um, and so right now we're looking at the average minimum temperature for the month of February. And for many of us, in the United States, it was pretty cold. So we can see things here are in, in a lot of uh, cases pretty close to freezing. Um, so this is a feature service uh, with US temperature and precipitation data that's um, available in the Living Atlas. Um, and again, as, as Charlie mentioned, you can access the Living Atlas data directly um, through ArcGIS Pro. Um, so I could go NGHCN and type that into from my portal and drop that into my map. And that's what I did to come up with this map that from this um, data set that Charlie published. Uh, but one of the other great things that you can do is leverage some of um, the other capabilities that the Living Atlas provides to um, live data um, and other data resources um, in your workflows in ArcGIS Pro. Um, so, I'm going to go over to another tab here, and this is looking at um, some of the uh, climate model data that we started off with. Um, and here I use the extract values to points tool that Charlie just showed um, on that RCP data. Um, but instead of uh, extracting the values to GHCN points, I just use major cities. Major cities. Um, from the Living Atlas. So I could drop those onto the map, or if you were just interested in US cities, you could do that. Um, and to those points, um, I was able to use what we call our enrichment. So our enrichment uh, tools, um, if, uh, you're in your analysis, uh, 
um, our Enrich tools allows you to add a rich um, source of population and demographic data to your features. So once I was able to do that, I could then just um, take my temperature and instead of just looking at temperature, also scale the way that we're mapping this information based on the population of that location and how warm it would be, or the difference in precipitation that we would expect in those major cities across the United States. So you can see that some major cities are getting more wet, some are getting drier. And then we can also do some relationship mapping with those two variables, temperature and precipitation, so you can see where things are going to be hot and wet, which, you know, more humid, more uh, greater heat indexes, things like that associated with major cities. Um, so that, that's a, another great little activity, and, I, and I've also um, had these, these feature services in the Living Atlas if you want to look those up. So, all right, it looks like Charlie is ready to go. So let's delve into some analysis on agricultural impacts with um, climate data in the U.S. Thanks, Dan. So next, I want to show you how this U.S. data that Dan just showed can be put to use. And I think it has, in particular, I saw a really useful uh, density of uh, features across the uh, Midwest. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, I went to Kansas State University, and one of their specialties is grain science. And you really can't escape Kansas State without learning a little bit about grain science. And in fact, uh, I met my wife there, who is a food scientist, and she's recently been researching uh, where wheat grows in the U.S. And that got me thinking, because I was also reading in the, uh, the Fourth National Climate Assessment about uh, the impacts of climate change. And in particular, Chapter 10 delves into the impacts to agriculture. And so I had remembered that we, the, we published a uh, layer in the Living Atlas for where different U.S. crops are grown. In fact, it's, you know, the, the layer is called uh, USA Cropland. And this will draw here in a moment. And it literally covers the U.S. with either crops that are grown or land cover. And let me uh, zoom in to give you an idea of just how refined this data is. Uh, it's literally going to show me uh, which crops are grown in which fields. And so if I click on uh, uh, an area here, I get winter wheat. And in fact, that's the crop I want to uh, take a look at. And so what I'm about to show is kind of a review of an analysis that I did. And it was a quick and dirty analysis that took about 30, only about 30 minutes to kind of conceive of and then also figure out. And the first step I did was I decided I was going to extract a, uh, uh, a subset of this uh, um, USA Cropland Service. And, and what I did was uh, figured out that the service from its uh, service documentation allows for a 24,000 by 24,000 cell extent to be used. So all I need to do is use the copy raster tool and I set my extent to be the one you see here. So this is now a local version of that data. And then I used our reclassify tool to isolate a footprint of where winter wheat is grown. So this gave me a sense of, okay, where should I focus uh, in terms of when I'm looking at the data? And then um, I added that uh, uh, GHCND US station uh, service to see, okay, yes, I'm, I'm getting good coverage across this entire region. And so I extracted just the stations in the study area so I could uh, run an easy model. And what I did was uh, I ran these models with the extract multi-values, except I, instead of taking one point, I got the cell values uh, for every one of these points in one analysis. And so that gives me something that we can see here, which uh, is one variable, which uh, in this case is the mean low temperature in July. And that gets to the things I want to look for that might affect winter wheat. Uh, there are a number of characteristics or a number of determinants that make winter wheat uh, able to be grown. Two of them are that uh, we need to have a cool enough winter. Uh, in other words, we need to have cold hours. And second is we can't have the summer be too hot. Uh, the summer, uh, cannot get above 26 degrees uh, Celsius for the uh, mean daily low temperature. And uh, you can see here that I'm not quite at that point in this area. And generally speaking, the uh, uh, southeast part of this area is the warmest. And so I actually went through each monthly value to make sure that in the summer months we didn't exceed, and in the winter months we didn't get too, too uh, uh, warm either. And so the good news was is in the historical data, everything was, was good to go. And then what I did was I took all the anomaly data and added it to, his, to the historical data to come up with, with what the future model temperature is. And I used that uh, same scenario we've been using before, which is the RCP 6.0 for 2050 to, or roughly for 2050, it's 2040 to 59. So sometimes we say 2050 to take the, uh, the mean year. And 
What I found then by repeating my uh, analysis was that there were some uh, interesting uh, results. So what we're seeing here is that uh, in green, so every dot or station that's represented there shows an area where we should still be able to grow winter wheat in 2050. The purple and the black dots, however, show where it's probably going to be too warm in the summer. Uh, and, and then the one orange dot down here in the southwest, uh, as well as the black dots, indicate where it might be too warm in the winter now. And what that means is, in particular, I went and looked at March and saw that the minimum temperature in March was now exceeding 4.4 degrees Celsius, which is the threshold for cold hours. And that can mean a couple of things, but the one thing that uh, with winter wheat that, that they would worry about is that you don't want to get into a freeze-thaw cycle, because if it thaws and the wheat germinates and then it freezes again, it can kill the wheat. And so this gives me a pretty good idea that you know winter wheat could be impacted pretty substantially in Texas and Oklahoma. And this is something that we would want to look at in terms of you know, do, how do we want to respond. Now granted, this is, a, is an incomplete scenario. It doesn't take into account a couple of other major factors, which include soil moisture, so it's got to be moist enough, and nor does it include the frequency and severity of summer storms. And that's potentially an issue as well. Uh, the good news is, is that these climate models that we've been using also model all of those things and take them into account. So we can uh, also produce a, 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 a more than a proof of concept model to, to evaluate this same kind of scenario. So that's the, the last of what I have to show and I'll turn things back over to Carissa to, to wrap up and to handle questions. Sure, thank you, Charlie, and also thank you, Dan. Um, I really appreciate you joining us today to demonstrate the value of doing climate analysis using ArcGIS Pro. And I love how you brought it home just to show um, how you can take it in your own further analysis based on a project that does interest you. Um, I do want to take some time just to answer some questions that were sent over to us. And if any questions are still lingering, please feel free to utilize the chat window. We'll continue to collect questions until the end of this webinar. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about the data collection stations for GHCND. Charlie, would you want to share more about, um, about the collection stations that we're all on board with how this data is actually collected and then how we process it? Sure, so this data is actually made available by NOAA, and they have a website, and, and the, the layers in the Living Atlas actually have the URLs for where all the information is stored. And what I did was I downloaded the uh, local data for every station. So what you get is a file that has all the daily values by month. So you get a, uh, a table, if you will, in a text file that has uh, each month and 31 days or columns, and then you extract the values from that. So what I did was restricted it to the years that I'm working with, and that came up with a, uh, um, uh, a set of means. And, and in particular, I was looking to make sure we had at least 15 days of uh, data every month, and that we had at least 10 years of data to factor into the average that we use. And again, that's all documented in the Living Atlas uh, the description of these layers. Very good. Um, and actually, since we're on the topic, can an organization share the climate data that they've prepared with the Living Atlas? Sure. Um, the um, If you go to the Living Atlas website and you have an ArcGIS Online account, once you're signed in at the very top right, you'll see um, an area called My Contributions. Um, and it, once you're signed into your account, if you click that, you'll see all the different layers uh, that you have that could be contributed to the Living Atlas in your ArcGIS Online account. Um, and from that, you can select to nominate different layers. Um, that'll start the nomination process that um, that myself and other people on the Living Atlas team are, are involved with. And then we work with people to make sure that that is um, data that can be used by the broader community. It's trustworthy, um, it's reliable, um, and it, it, it's easy to use. Okay, and are there other data sets available that are along the same topic that might be interesting to explore in Living Atlas? Sure, we have a lot of weather and climate related data in the Living Atlas. And if you're in the browse section online of the Living Atlas, there's actually a weather slash climate section that you can go to. Um, and so we have a lot of real time updating data from uh, people like NOAA, NASA, and UCAR, NCAR. Um, and then there's a lot more uh, static data sets, uh, just like the ones that we've seen today. Very good, very good. It's always good to have all the extra data so you can bring in additional uh, ideas for you to using your analysis. But of course, in true Esri fashion, I have to ask you all before we leave, what's next? 
Well, we have one thing that we're particularly excited about, which is that uh, recently we began a collaboration with the uh, Climate Science Center at, the, at Texas Tech University to produce not only these data sets of temperature and precipitation for these U.S. stations, but they've also modeled several dozen impact relevant indicators such as extreme heat days, heavy rainfall, drought, and many more. So that's something that we'll be looking at over the next couple of quarters to get released into the living atlas. Very good. Uh, that's exciting. And I'll keep everyone um, in the know about how, what new layers are coming in. Um, and, and when we think about staying involved, we do have um, our GeoNet page. So if questions do continue to arise, please, please feel free to reach out, join in the conversation uh, via the ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World GeoNet. We also have our blog, which um, we, we do encourage you to participate um, in reading. We often update daily um, based on new information that we do have coming in, new apps, new maps, new story maps. And then we also have our newsletter. So if you're not currently receiving this, I do encourage you um, to follow along in this journey. We do have a newsletter, newsletter that goes out monthly, um, and you'll receive the webinar recording uh, via that newsletter if you are following along with us. So as we move on, I just want to make sure that you all know this is a spatial data webinar series. And our next, um, our next webinar will be Authoritative Data 101, and that will take place on March 12th. I'll have Lucy Guerra and Sarah Osborne, who are our product managers for data and location services in. We're going to talk to you a little bit about our quality data. So that includes um, the data available in the Living Atlas. It includes our on-prem options, as well as um, the data available in Marketplace. So um, there is a link to sign up to that in our resources page. And uh, we just want to thank you today for joining us. As always, it is great to have you on board. Thank you for um, being here with us. And if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. Happy mapping.